We are in a series on emotionally healthy relationships, and the thesis of this sermon series is found in a quote by Pete Scazzaro in his book, um, uh, The Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, or Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, and it says this. I've been reading this at the top of every sermon. Emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable. It is not possible for a Christian to be spiritually, spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. So spiritual maturity, if you think you know so much about the Bible or you pray X amount of hours a day or whatever, and if you're spiritually or emotionally immature, those two things are incompatible. And what this series has tried to do is to kind of correlate the two to bridge that gap. Um, So that's what we're going to be talking about today, especially as as it comes to having integration and living with integrity. So before I pray, I'd like to share one more quote. It's actually something I've quoted to this congregation a few times over the last nine years, and it goes like this. No pastor lives up to what he preaches. If he does, his preaching is too low. (laughs) So now there's some nuance to that. I don't step step up here every week and go, yeah, you you guys should do this um, because I can't, so you should. Um, That's not what it's saying. Um, It's saying that every week I step up here, this is the one of the difficulties in teaching regularly is I get up here and I have to teach what I first have committed to Christ to embody. And that's really hard. Um, And then I have to do the the work of um, confessing the gap between what I'm going to say and where my life is currently. And at this point, I I don't even know where that quote is from at this point, but I feel this once again. Um, I will say today, as I get into this topic, I haven't figured this out, but I'm on my way. I feel like I'm further down the road than I've ever been in my life. I've tried to do the hard work before I ever gave this teaching to live into this by God's grace, and I know that I've come up way short still. So as you listen, know that I'm as much in need of grace as many of you are. So let's pray. Lord, that was my confession to this congregation, and I confess this before you as well, that a lot of what I'll be saying, there's a gap between... um, what I desire for my life personally, and more importantly, what you desire for my life personally and where I am today. There's disintegration that I still live with that by your grace, I'm, uh, uh, you're, you're, oh, you're closing the gap. And I know that, that for many of us in this congregation, that's the same thing, Lord. Um, when I even use the word integrity, that just that word's convicting sometimes. Or when I use the word living and integration, that is too convicting. And I guess I can just say that and we can be done um, this morning. But I know there's a lot more work that you want to do. And so would you give us your grace, the power of your spirit? Um, I submit all of my capacities to you. And I say, I just stand up here as a person in need myself as well. We are all broken and you are making us all whole in Christ. So thank you for that. Um, Go before us, we pray in Christ's strong name. Amen. All of us live with the incredible pressure to live a life that is not our own. So to actually live into our true self in Christ is one of the great tasks of our discipleship to Jesus. This is from my guy, Ron Rollheiser. I've quoted him so much. Now he's just my guy. I'm just going to say that. It's my guy, Ron Rollheiser. He says this, from the minute we are born, we begin to struggle to get our lives together. That is to come to a sense of who we are, of what our meaning is and of how we can live in such a way that our own lives remain integrated and meaningful and that our presence in the world is a positive one. This is our great task right here, to live a life that's integrated and whole, to live with what is called integrity, by which by, means this by definition, by the way. Integrity is the state of being whole, entire or undiminished. Now, some of you guys, when you think of integrity, you just think just simply of honesty. It's more than live an honest or an honest life. It's living a whole life, an integrated life, an entire life, an undiminished life. Today, I want to talk about living with integrity and living integrated, meaning when who you are on the inside matches who you are on the outside, where you're living whole, living not for the pleasing of others, but living out of your identity in Christ and the deep values that flow from that. And the way this fits into emotionally healthy relationships, you're like, hey, I thought this is identity. How does it fit into how I relate with other people? That can be summarized by by a line in the poem by the poet Rumi where he says, if you are here unfaithfully with us, you're causing terrible damage. If you are here unfaithfully with us, you're causing 
terrible damage. Let that sit for a second. And this community, we need you to show up in our life, not enmeshed, not codependent, and not just trying to please everyone. That's horrible, not just for you, but for everyone else in your life and in this community, and it causes terrible damage. And this is the way of, uh, of living, this way of living where you lived an enmeshed, enmeshed life or a codependent life or a life pleasing other people might work for a short while, but it will, it will come crashing down like a house of cards and with it all and many of the things you hold dear. See, what is best is you knowing who you are in Christ and what God has called your life into existence for and you living into that while at the same time remaining close and committed to people important to you, even when you don't agree with them. This requires listening to God, receiving an identity and vocation from Him, and understanding how He has uniquely made you. This is the task of living with integrity and living integrated. And because with topics like this, when we're talking about who we are becoming and the deep things of the soul, to grasp them, sometimes we need examples. Oftentimes we need examples. So I'll start with what integration and integrity looks like, what it doesn't look like, and then I'll talk about how we can get there. So what does it look like? Let's give an example of what integrity or integration looks like. Let's look at the example of Jesus. High bar. Let's just start there. Let's just go to Jesus, okay? It seemed almost everyone who surrounded Jesus placed expectations on him of who they thought he should be or what they thought he should do. In other words, they placed on him a false self. Everyone did this. Even Satan did this. Everyone did this. And it was Jesus' job, being fully human, to know who he truly was and to live out of that reality. And as Jesus lived faithfully from his true self, we are told in the Gospels that he disappointed a lot of people. In the wake of knowing who he was... From getting his identity from the Father, he lived in light of who he was, and he disappointed a lot of people. As he grew up, he became at the baptism, when, at his baptism, when the Spirit descended upon him, and the and the, the word from the Father saying, "You're my son, you're my beloved son, and, who, and I love you, and whom I'm well pleased." When he gets that word from the Father, that's his identity. He lives out of that identity, and by living out of that identity, he and he lived out of his call in his life. He had to withstand enormous pressure from people telling him otherwise. For example, here's all the people that Jesus disappoints. First of all, Jesus disappointed his family. He left his family of origin and even some of their expectations of growing up as like a carpenter's son and became an adult that was guided from a centered place of listening to God's voice. And as a result, he disappointed them. In Mark 3.21, we have... um, this story of them going to Jesus and calling him outside and he doesn't go and he says, this is my mother and brother and family, if you guys remember the story from a couple weeks ago, and they call Jesus out of his mind. That Jesus is out of his mind, Mark 3.21. Jesus disappoints his family. Jesus disappointed the people from his hometown of Nazareth. When he was declared that he was Messiah to the people he grew up with, he went in the synagogue, opened up the scroll of Isaiah, read this prophecy of the Messiah, and said, that's who I am. People were like, ooh, that's weird. And then he starts saying about how a prophet isn't accepted in his hometown, and he, com- and he compares Nazareth to this, uh, this city in the Old Testament that had judgment upon it. And then they took him to the edge of a cliff to try to throw him off the cliff. And somehow he just had this like ninja move where he just walked through the crowds. I don't know. It just says they took him to the edge of the cliff and Jesus was like, like just walks right through the crowd and just goes away. I don't know what that's about. I I want to learn that thing. So so he disappoints um, his hometown. He even disappoints his closest friends. His closest friends projected onto him their own picture of who the Messiah was to be. Some of his disciples quit on him. One of them betrayed him due to his disappointment in Jesus. Even though they misunderstood him, Jesus never held that against them. He was forgiving up to his death. Jesus disappointed the religious community. They hated the disruption Jesus brought to their religious systems and rules. And eventually attributed all his real power to demons. Like, you know how you're really able to do this? You have the power of Beelzebub, the the, the chief of demons. That's how you're empowered. You're empowered by Satan himself. Now, Jesus was disappointed all of these people. Nevertheless, he was able to maintain 
a non-anxious presence in the midst of all the stress. So, Jesus remained who He was as He loved, served, sacrificed without holding anything against anyone. Actually, what He did, he's, He moved toward people. He was so secure in who He was, He was so sure of His identity that even when people were rejecting Him, He kept moving toward them and ultimately died on a cross for them. This is complete integrity and integration. Emotionally Healthy Spirituality says this, Jesus was not selfless. He did not live as if only other people counted. He knew his own value and worth. He had friends. He asked people to help him. At the same time, he was not selfish. He did not live as if nobody else counted. He gave his life out, for, out of love for others. From a place of loving union with his father, Jesus had a mature, healthy, true self. See, Jesus wasn't selfless, totally selfless, like, oh, I don't have a self. I don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a person. I'm not a person. I'm just here to serve you and help you and help you and help you and enmesh with you. And your joy becomes my joy. And that's the only joy I ever get in this life. That is not who Jesus was. He wasn't selfless, but he also wasn't selfish. He didn't care just about himself and finding his true self and his, and his super zen, like no one else touched him, no one else mattered in his life, never cried, never wept over brokenness in the world. That wasn't Jesus either. He completely knew himself and at the same time moved toward other people in compassion, love, and grace, and mercy, and truth. Jesus knew who he was and what he was here to do all the way down. So much so when his flesh was weak, he was willing to sweat blood in a garden in order to keep his integrity and his commitments. He, he wrestled with the will of God for his life. He wrestled it all the way down to the point of sweating blood in a garden so he can live whole. And he arose from that garden and he went to his sacrificial death. Jesus lived a whole and integrated life to the very end, even as he died for the people who hated what he was. That's what it looks like. That's what integration looks like. Okay. Now, that's obviously a high bar. That bar is called perfection. So I know that that's like high bar here. Um, but we're in Christ. And uh, Christ is not only our, um, our great uh, Savior. He's also our great example. But what does integrity and integration not look like? What does it look like when it goes bad? What does it look like when you live out of disintegration? Well, your Bibles are turned to Galatians 2. Uh, I'm going to look at verse 11, and I'm going to read that down to verse 14 in a second. The context of this verse here, Peter, who is mentioned in this, uh, 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 Cephas, Cephas is what it says in, if you have NIV, or Peter if you have a different translation, same, same person. <clears throat> when Peter first came to Antioch from Jerusalem... Um, he was welcomed and he ate was with Gentile Christians. See, Jews and Gentiles have a storied racist history. We'll talk about that more in a couple of weeks. What's important to jump in in the story right here is that Peter was one of the people that God used to tear down the wall between Jew and Gentile in Christ. He actually had a vision when he was supposed to go to a Gentile's house and, 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 and be with them and, and, and meet with them and pray for them. And he saw the Holy Spirit fall upon them. And he realized that what the Old Testament said is true, that Jew and Gentile in Christ are one now. He, did, he just couldn't believe it before. But now he experienced it from the Holy Spirit himself. Jew and Gentile are one now. And so when he went to Antioch, this early church that was starting and was becoming really known in and around that region, he goes there to visit what, what God's doing in this church. And Jew and Gentile were eating together, and he was doing the same thing. He was eating with the Gentiles, being a Jew himself. And then this is what happens. Paul shows up in Antioch, and he observes something. When Peter, when Peter came to Antioch, I, Paul, the apostle who's writing this, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, Barnabas is like the most innocent guy in the New Testament, right? He's so innocent. He's like the encourager. Paul's like, even Barnabas, you got Barnabas to sin, bro. You're going to hell. You got Barnabas to sin. 
Like that sort, he didn't say that, but he's kind of saying that, right? Even Barnabas was led astray. I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. So what's going on here? Well, after Peter was in Antioch a while, a group of Jewish Christians arrived. He says from James, from, from James place or James council. Um, a group of Jewish Christians arrived and somehow began to influence Peter to withdraw and separate from the Gentiles he used to eat with. The Greek there, the word draw back and separate is in the imperfect tense, meaning it was written in a way to say that Peter did this gradually. Little by little, he began to separate from the Gentiles. He began to start acting racist. And as the increasing pressures of Jerusalem visitors began to persuade him, he did all the more before, before you know it, he was not eating with the Gentiles. Paul shows up and he sees what's going on and he rebukes Peter in front of everyone and he says to Peter, you are being a hypocrite. Literally, you're, act, you're not acting in line with the gospel or you're not acting in line with the truth. The Greek word there is literally hypocrite. And what that means is that Peter is not living in line with what he believes to be the truth. Peter, you have a truth in you. You have a truth that you've attested to. You have a truth that you stood in front of the Jerusalem council and said, this is true. You witnessed something with your own eyes that Jew and Gentile are brought into the family of God through what Christ has done. You know that's true, and you're not living in line with what you know to be true. You're not living with integrity. You are not living with integration. You are not living out of wholeness. You are disintegrated. You are not living in line with it. There's a brokenness that's happening there. There's something you know to be true on the inside, and you're not living in line with that on the outside. What he believes on the inside is what Jesus told him by special revelation. And he's not living outwardly in line with that. He's living disintegrated. And this is often how we live. Where our convictions, our truth of who we are in Christ as being disciples of Christ do not match up with how we live or how we act at work or with the person we're dating or with our kids or whatever the list goes on. And as you may have noticed, this dips into people-pleasing. Peter started to do this to please the visitors, doing what you think others want you to do. This is very, very easy to do in a town like San Francisco. People in San Francisco expect you to act like a San Franciscan. You're a millennial. They expect you to believe like a millennial, a Korean American, someone who's same-sex attracted, a woman whatever. There are all these things and these ways that people expect you to act and expect you to believe about whatever issue. And so many times we are guilty of not living in line with the truth of the gospel because we lost who we are. We have forgot who we are and we forgot our convictions. We have lost sight of our true self in Christ. And of course, this does not happen overnight. For most of us, this stuff happens in the gradual pool of soft influence, the beauty of a coffee house, the soft power of San Francisco, the soft power of progressive colonization, or as my friend Mark Sayers calls it, Western supremacy. You are supposed to believe what Western enlightenment tells you to believe. And if you don't believe that and you hold to this old ancient book called the Bible, you should, you're, you're, you're ignorant, you're regressive, you're stupid, or whatever, whatever the thing is. And so we shrink back and we begin to compromise what we believe. And we, and we fit ourselves into what a San Franciscan Christian is. Not a, not a Christian, but a San, a San Franciscan Christian. And then we yell at people from the other side of the nation that they're being Bible Belt Christians. And I can't believe that you just, everyone looks the same there. And they look at San Francisco, but you guys all look the same there. (laughs) So the question is, the question is, before you know it, you start acting and believing like every other West Coast millennial. So the question is, how do you become integrated? How do, you, how do you live out of your convictions, not someone else's convictions, from the truth of your identity in Christ, not someone else's cultural myth of how they think you should believe? How do you become integrated? How do you begin to live out of integrity and wholeness? 
I believe living integrated requires at least a couple of things. First, it requires knowing your own identity. You must know, and I've been hinting at this throughout this, our time so far, you must know your own identity in Christ. You must know your identity in Christ. Living integrated requires that you know who you are. What you believe about yourself is the foundation of your life. It is your identity, and a faulty foundation will cause cracks in the soul. An emotionally healthy life, an integrated life, begins with what you believe about yourself. Now, I've written on this topic a few years ago in a book on identity, and this for me is like a life message for me. Not only one that I, I continually are trying to live into, but one that I continually try to bring before people. I want to help people know who they are in Christ. Because many of us don't really live out of the truth of who we are in Christ. We live out of half-truths about us, true things but not the truest thing about us, partial truths or even outright lies of who we are. We've built our identity around a few things. Here how, here's how we construct an identity today. We usually construct an identity by what we do. I am what I do. This is, our, our, this is so popular in San Francisco, right? Everyone, most people move here for a job. So you are your career. You move to San Francisco because you're so good at what you do, you're going to do it in San Francisco and make a living at it. So this is our career, our art, our craft, our discipline. We find meaning in the things that we do and do well. And this makes a ton of sense because normally what we do takes up most of our time and our thought life. And so it's really easy to find an identity in what we do. It's easy for me to find an identity in the fact that I'm a pastor of a church in San Francisco. To find an identity there is actually so tempting to me that I, I have to combat it all the time. We also construct an identity around I am what I have. These are things that we earn or acquire like money or possessions, things given to us, maybe even things that are out of our control. This is like positively like I am, I find my identity in my good looks or my fashion sense or I'm super creative or I have a magnetic personality or I'm charming or I'm intuitive or whatever. And we find an identity out of what we, what we have, those things that were just like given to us. Or even negatively, we find an identity in being the person who grew up without a dad or an abusive or broken home or a certain disability or shortcoming. And we find an identity there and we live out of identity there. We live out of these half-truths or sometimes lies from these places. Or I am what I desire. Like we say things like, I want to be true to myself. I'm not my job. I'm not my art. I'm not my family. I'm just me. Whatever I desire, however I want to express myself, when I look deep, deep down inside, I just am who I am. And so because of that, our town is very famous for this. We make an identity out of what we desire sexually. So whether you're gay or straight, this is our, this is our identity now. And we make a whole identity structure out of what we want in life what we want, what we desire in life. We do this in all kinds of different ways, but this is how we construct a modern identity. I am what I desire, or I am what people say that I am. I am what I grew up, or even in, this, in, this, uh, in our society, what people say I am, that's what I am. Yesterday, Ash, Junie, Prince, and I, the list is getting longer, people who, who go on these walks with, with us as a family. It used to be just Ash and I, now it's a whole thing. Um, on Sabbath, we go, for a, 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 we go for a Sabbath walk every Sabbath. Our, we Sabbath on Saturdays. And every Sabbath, we walk slowly and we walk deliberately. Um, so I don't romanticize this too much. We walked after a huge argument yesterday. So this, so you know, it's not perfect in our household. So we fought and then we walked. Okay, so there you go. Um, so we're walking. I'm walking deliberately. We're walking slow. We talk about our week, about giving thanks to God for the things that happened throughout our, our week. And we try to walk open to conversations with other people, especially the poor. And so when we pass people who are poor or, or are, are begging or are sitting there, not begging, just there, we always, especially Ashley, make eye contact and try to have a conversation if they want to. And then it turns into if there's any way we can help you. And so we, we try to make space on our day for that to happen. But as we were in the park, um, Golden Gate Park, there's a lot of parks here, so the Gold, Golden Gate Park, um, there was a man who was shouting horrible obscenities, like aggressive, 
horrible obscenities to people, stuff I do not want to repeat. And immediately my defenses go up, right? So I turn into like John Wick to protect my family. Like all of a sudden, like, bam, like just like, <clears throat> not, not really, but you get it, right? So that, that thing happens there. Um, and then Ash, as we're walking, she just says this, I wonder, I wonder if the things he's yelling at other people are the things that were yelled at him when he was young. And we just listened. And as we continue to listen, that helped me see this man in a whole new way. This is probably clearly what was yelled to him and at him when he was young. See, many of us have gathered an identity from what other people have said about us. And now we're addicted to it. It was abusive when we were young, and now we try to turn it into a strength, and we just live to please other people, and we've made a career out of it, some of us. We must know what people say and think about us to know who we are. We feed off of pleasing people. We feed off of that chatter. We feed off of, uh, of, of that reaction. We feed off of it, and social media is giving us a whole new realm to do this. Now, here's the thing. What we do, what we have, what we desire, what we say, all those things may be true of you, but they're not the truest thing. The truest thing about you is that you're loved by God and your identity is in Christ. In Christ, union with God is the dominant way the New Testament talks about our identity. This is all of Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3. Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3, there are no indicatives there. There are only uh, or no imperatives there, there are only indicatives. There are only things that are true about you until Paul finally gets to what you're to do with all these things that are true about you. And he says, here's the first indicative, uh, sorry, here's the first imperative, live worthy of this identity. Basically, live into who you are in Christ. That's what Ephesians is talking about. David Brenner in his book, The Gift of Being Yourself, which is an incredible book on identity, if you want to start reading or starting that topic, says this, the true self is who, in reality, you are and who you are becoming. It is not something you need to construct through a process of self-improvement or deconstruct by means of psychological analysis. It is not an object to be grasped, nor is it an archetype to be actualized. It is, it is not even some inner hidden part of you. Rather, it is your total self as you were created by God and as you are being redeemed in Christ. It is the image of God that you are, the unique face of God that has been set aside from eternity for you. Your identity in Christ is the truest part of you, accepted in God, so happy that you exist. I'm starting to understand that now as I hold my daughter, and I'm just, she doesn't really do that much <laughs> yet. I'm just happy she exists delighting in her, I'm starting to see. I'm starting to see that thing that every parent says, just wait. Wait when you have a kid. You're going to understand God's love for you in a deeper way. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. I know. God loves me like a dad. I get it. Um, but I, f I feel it now. It's like in my bones now. I get, I get the way that Eugene Peterson translated um, what God said to Jesus in, in his baptism. You're my son um, who I'm so proud of. I'm so proud that you exist. I'm just proud that you exist. I'm getting that now. This is how God sees us. We're brought into union with God, not by anything you have earned or have done, but by grace through Christ's work to redeem you. That's who you are. You no longer need to earn it by what you do or try to grasp it by what you have or try to find it by what you desire or try to listen to outside voices by living into other people's expectation of you. It's what God has done for you and what God says about you. An integrated whole living starts with knowing your identity. Because when you start to know your identity, you can start living into your identity and making that, that gospel truth the whole of your life. Now, once, you, once you've done the work and once you've done the work to, to realize your identity in Christ, the, the next thing integration requires is that you live out of your identity in Christ, and this is called vocation. That you would live into your vocation. You must live your vocation. So you believe your identity, you know your identity in Christ, and you live out of that, and that's called, traditionally it's been called vocation. Vocation is from the Latin word mean, meaning calling. So some of people have said, what is your calling in life? What is your vocation in life? So the logic goes like this. If what God says about you is the truest thing about you, then from that voice we also find what we're placed on this earth for. 
And the closer we live in line with that voice, that calling, the more integrated we will be. This takes time, though. Let me say, if you are 24 years old and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so far from finding, it's okay. You can discover this as you hang on to your identity and know your identity in Christ. And I'll talk a little bit about that. First of all, let me talk about some distortions around vocation or calling. There's some distortions around this idea throughout church history, and I want to call out a few. The first is the Catholic distortion, and then the Orthodox distortion, and then the Protestant distortion. Okay, the Catholic distortion says this. There's the contemplative life, the high life, and the active life, the low life. And so if you are a contemplative, you spend most of your day praying, you, 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 you cloister yourself, that is the contemplative life, the high life. Throughout church history, Catholics uh, have said this. And then the active life is like the low life. You kind of just do, you just like can work in the world and you're secular. You have a secular life, okay? That's, that, that's, that's a distortion of vocation. Orthodox distortion is there's the clergy, the true disciples that have devoted their life to ministry, and then everyone else, parishioners that kind of just come and get, get ministered to by the clergy. That's the orthodox distortion. The Protestant distortion, which is very popular, is that vocation equals your occupation. So the Protestant distortion is like, you know what, your, your calling your life is what you do for a living. It's like your, your occupation, what you do. Like, go find your calling. If, you, if you're doing a job that you love, you're in your calling. We've distorted it just to mean your job, okay? That's a weak, weak way of looking at vocation, by the way. Vocation can be summarized by three things. First, vocation is your call to be human. San Franciscans that are super into robots right now, this is really important for you to realize. You are a human. And your call is to live into your humanity. I know there are many of you that are trying to hack this whole thing to keep by taking 500 different vitamins and microdosing LSD to keep your brain going forever. And you're like, what, whatever, you're a human. You're a human. You are limited. You've been created by God. You need relationships, good, healthy ones. And we share this humanity with the rest of the world. This keeps us from thinking that we're superhuman that we can live forever outside of Christ or that we're a superior human and we deserve this thing in San Francisco and everyone else deserves that thing in San Francisco. That they're a worse human and you're a better human or maybe you're a worse human and they're a better human. Your vocation is to live in the fact that you're human and because you're human, God places on every human unlimited dignity and worth, every single soul. The second part of your vocation is the call to be Christian or the call to be, I, th I read this, uh, this last week from um, someone named Cornelius Plantinga. He said this, your call and vocation is to be a prime citizen in God's kingdom. A prime citizen in God's kingdom. Not simply I just live here, whatever, but you actually have as a part of God's kingdom, a call, a unique call to be a part of this kingdom and the building of this kingdom. So our main vocation is first to be human, but second, to be a Christian. That is, our vocation is to be part of God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so we seek to do that in everything that we do. So we live into this life and being part of God's kingdom, the kingdom of justice and holiness and righteousness and truth, grace, peace, we live into this vocation. In every relationship, we desire what God desires. We, we can do this through parenting, or we can do this through neighborhood action, or we can do this through protesting, or we can do this through policy, or we can do this in hospitality with our neighbors, or serving at our church. The list is endless, but we are prime citizens of God's kingdom. So as a, living in San Francisco, our vocation is to be Christians here, and to be Christians bringing about the kingdom of God in San Francisco. That is our vocation. Okay, but thirdly, call, the call is to your uniqueness. This doesn't mean that we're all the same. The first two is this. If, you, if you're a human, we're all the same. If you're a Christian, we're all the same. Like, we're all part in this. I don't play a larger part than you play as a pastor in this city. You play a huge part in God's kingdom. But now the third is a call to your uniqueness. This is where your personality mixed with your gifts, mixed with your abilities, mixed with your deepest desires come to life. Again, this could be your occupation, but it doesn't have to be your occupation. 
Frederick Buechner famously has said about calling and vocation that our vocation is this. The place God calls you or your vocation is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. That is your unique call, your unique vocation. And I want to point out it takes some discovery there. The third point may or may not be your occupation. If it is, you do it as a part of the other two vocations. I'm a human. I'm not a Messiah. I can't do it all. I'm not a robot. I won't live forever. I do it as limited. I need rest. I need sleep. And I do it as a Christian. Some of us just jump to the third one. I want my unique thing. And but you have to remember, your vocation is to be human. You're a human. You're not God. And you're not a robot. Secondly, you're a Christian. And you're about God's kingdom. And thirdly, there's a unique place that God has for you here. When I think of this, I think of my friend Jess, Jessica. And she works in um, labor and delivery, as a labor and delivery nurse at the General Hospital um, in Petro Hill. And um, she was our doula when Ash gave birth. And she is, she's an incredible person. And when she's around birth, she comes alive. She, was, she wanted to be a pediatrician, went to school, thinking she'd be a pediatrician. Um, she was a, a tech um, right out of college um, in Santa Barbara um, in a labor and delivery place. And she witnessed, she said she witnessed her first delivery and that was it. This is what I'm called to do. I want to do this for the rest of my life. This is the Beekner thing, deep gladness and deep hunger meet. And the way she talks about labor and delivery and the way she cares for every single person who is delivering babies at the general hospital, if you know anything about the general hospital, it's everyone. Everyone. It's like she, whenever she talks about labor and delivery, it's like she's talking about something holy. She is. She knows she's talking about something holy. And when you sit with her, she has a whole theology of labor. She's thought about the theology of labor. She's thought about how it's part of the inbreaking kingdom of God and how she plays a part in it and her role in it. When I sit with her and, and we were going through our d d doula class thing, every single time she would talk, I looked at Ash and I would go, you are super human. How do you do? Like the way that she talked about what God does in growing a child and birthing a child, this is vocation. She's human. She knows it. She's a Christian. And she sees that unique thing here. And it's unbelievable to witness. Those three things, those three things in a way to find a vocation. So you live integrated by identity and vocation and working that out in an integrated whole way. Now, I want to end here. This is really important because this is how this fits into our emotionally healthy relationship skill of Climbing the ladder of integrity, as the Emotionally Healthy Relationship series calls it, or as we're calling it, living in integration or living with integrity. Here's why this is important. And the term is this, differentiation. Write this term down. This term was developed in modern family systems theory, and it refers to this. Differentiation is a person's capacity to define his or her own life goals and values apart from the pressure of those around them. This is how it fits into emotionally healthy relationships because this involves the ability to hold on to who you are and let go of who you're not. You can be and live into your identity in Christ and your vocation as one of his children and have values and convictions around that that are not dependent on the people or the pressures around you in, especially in San Francisco. You can be who you are in Christ. This does not mean you're a detached person who doesn't care about other people. Quite the opposite. You can move towards people, not in codependency, not in enmeshment, but in healthy, whole relationship. This means you don't have to agree with everyone. This means that you don't need everyone to agree with you. You can remain in a community group where you don't see eye to eye with the other person and not go like, okay, I don't agree with you, so now I have to reject you. This is what happens. We don't know how to disagree and have in, insane and intense unity with each other. You, for some of you, the way that you, when that happens, when you don't agree with another person 
And this is really important as we move into race and the gospel and as we move into sexuality later on in the summer. This is so important that you understand this, that you can have convictions and know who you are in Christ and then disagree with someone in your community group and have a very important conversation where you're moving toward each other and you're not enmeshing, where you're not like going, okay, if I hear your story, I have to become like you and think like you in order to love you. That's, that's, not, that's not it. I don't have to agree with me to love me. I could remain me and you could remain you and we can disagree and then we can have a good conversation around this. This is super, super important, especially, um, especially in, in, um, in ways that we want to detach. When you get around a community group and everyone believes a certain way and you think, oh, I'm the only person that believes like this, so I have to detach, I have to reject people, I have to avoid them, or I have to criticize them behind their back. Oh, my community group, they're all like a bunch of crazy, insane liberal people that just live, whatever. And you just criticize them to your mom on the phone when you're talking to her, like, oh my gosh, this place is crazy. That, that's how you detach from them and you don't, or some of us just enmesh, like, oh, I had these convictions when I moved here and now I, I look around in San Francisco, I have to become like everyone else and oh my gosh, I just lost myself in them. These, both of these things need to be avoided in healthy relationships. You need to be able to show up as yourself, who you are in Christ, with the convictions of being a Christian and your uniqueness in this city and show up well to other people. And I can actually, as this kind of person, bind myself to you and remain myself. I can make a covenant with this city. I can say, I'm here. I'm here until we die. I'm so committed to the city, and the city could reject me, but I could remain myself and do that. I could commit myself to a church. I could commit myself to a community group, and we can wrestle and argue and fight and not agree, and I could remain myself and bind myself to them. And by that, God makes me more and more who I am. You can be yourself apart from others. Henry Nouwen, this is a good way to close this sermon. To the degree that we have lost our dependencies on this world, Whatever that, that, whatever world means, father, mother, children, career, success, or rewards, we can form a community of faith in which there is little to defend, but much to share. Living with integrity and integration is one of the great goals of life. How do you grow old and be completely you as God has made you and redeemed you? This is what our world needs. Now, I can give you how to apply, I actually can't, I can't give you how to apply this uniquely to your life. For one, I'm out of time. The clock says zero, literally zero on the back. (laughs) But secondly, that's the job of the Spirit and you. It takes self-reflection. It takes repentance confessing the gap from who you are in Christ to how you're showing up in the world right now. And it takes the Spirit's revelation. Would you stand with me as we pray?